Chalet de Mott is a, a senior research scientist in the Department of Atmospheric Science at Colorado State University. And she will be talking about diagnosing sources of tropical SST drift in coupled forecast models. Chalet, we're looking forward to your talk. All right, thank you, Judith, and thank you, Anish. Um, so I think we've pretty much covered my first slide of the presentation. So I will go on ahead and move on. And I'll, uh, if, if I'm rattled today, this talk is being given during the intermission of our uh, NSFRU student symposium today. So I've been listening to talks. I'll give a talk, then I'll go listen to some more. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, the, to the topic of my talk is really focused on SST drift and coupled forecast models. And so um, as just a way to motivate this, we can just ask the question, why consider the ocean in terms of its um, contributions to S2S forecast skill? And this is just a very simple picture that I've shown in other talks um, that talks about how SST variability is communicated to the atmosphere via surface fluxes. And the point of this figure is to illustrate that really um, a variety of processes can contribute to surface fluxes, processes in the atmosphere um, associated with cloudiness and processes in the ocean that can influence the sea surface temperature. And so um, there's a couple, way, a couple of questions that you can ask um, in terms of S2S forecasting. And one is, what ocean processes affect the atmosphere via the fluxes? And another reason that you might care about ocean processes on S2S timescales is that ocean weather um, in its own right can be important for biological species, commercial activity, et cetera. So there's sort of two components. The ocean can affect the atmosphere. And as we've heard from previous talks, um, the tropical convection then um, regulates weather globally via teleconnections, but also ocean weather can have its own impacts without really even considering its feedback to the ocean. So this is a, a figure from the citation shown here. Uh, it's just a very nice illustration of some ocean processes that can affect the air-sea exchange. Um, and so in most of my talk, I'll be considering the region of the Indo-Pacific warm pool. Um, this type of figure can be considered anywhere on the globe. Um, but if you consider it in terms of the warm pool, you have the upper ocean mixed layer. Some of the processes that can affect the sea surface temperature is vertical mixing across the mixed layer base, either by uh, Kelvin Helmholtz instability, mixed layer turbulence, entrainment at the mixed layer base, and heat fluxes uh, from the mixed layer to the deeper ocean. There are also circulations that take place within the mixed layer. Um, so these are ocean processes. The atmosphere then, of course, interacts with the ocean. Uh, so for example, cloudiness regulates the amount of solar heating that uh, impacts the upper ocean. Winds contribute to mixing, which can extend down throughout the depth of the mixed layer. And then all of these processes together uh, lead to sea surface temperature variability, which is then communicated back to the atmosphere through surface fluxes. So how might ocean, I'm sorry, this is a poor title. How might ocean variability uh, affect S2S forecasts? So there's a couple ways to think about this. Two of them are really related to the coupled model itself. Two of them are more of natural variety. So you can imagine if you have a coupled forecast model, both the ocean and the atmosphere have to be initialized. So um, how well both of these components are initialized may affect the coupled feedbacks that take place during the model integration. There's also this tendency for coupled forecast models to want to drift to their preferred climatological state. And I'll show an example of this in a couple slides. Um, so those are model specific considerations, but there are also um, more fundamental issues such as the, the nature of ocean coupled feedbacks themselves. Um, and so when you initialize a coupled forecast model, some things that might matter for how your forecast proceeds are what is the initial state of the ocean? Um, are you initializing your model over 
a region of warm SST anomalies, cold SST anomalies? How might those things evolve with time? And then also how might the upper ocean itself evolve during your forecast integration by some of those processes that I showed in the previous schematic illustration. So my focus today is really going to be on some of the model aspects. And so I will also be uh, focusing how some of these model initializ initialization and drift aspects will affect the MJO, since the MJO is a good thing to talk about in a workshop devoted to S2S processes. So as we all well know by now, the MJO is a source of S2S predictability. And it has been shown in many studies that including ocean coupling um, generally improves MJO forecast skill. So uh, this slide is intended to give an overview of sort of the two main aspects of model, uh, coupled model forecasts that I want to consider here in the context of the MJO. And so the main point to note is that um, we know that the mean state moisture and anomalous winds are really key to the MJO eastward propagation. And so what we're seeing in this plot is the November through April mean state SST uh, given in the shading, and then the mean state total column water vapor or um, yeah, total column water shown with contours. And you can just look at this and with your eye and see that the two are closely related. And indeed the spatial uh, correlation of these two variables over the dom domain shown is about 0 0.85. So um, for the MJO, um, I'm sorry, so, so we have a high correlation between these two variables. And furthermore, SST anomalies about this mean state help regulate the uh, boundary layer energy, the buoyancy, this can affect convection, and also wind anomalies that would be part of the MJO. So just to illustrate this visually, if you have a MJO convection here in the Eastern Indian Ocean, um, that is associated with low level wind circulations as shown with these blue uh, ellipses. So you have cyclonic flow in the Northern and Southern hemisphere to the West of the convection. And then you have a more broad region of anti-cyclonic flow to the East. And really it's, where these two circulations meet up and you have regions of strong poleward flow. This strong poleward flow affects the high mean state moisture near the equator poleward. And this is a primary mechanism that contributes to the eastward propagation of the MGO. So the key point is that it's really the mean state moisture, which is strongly tied to the mean state SST that interacts with anomalous winds that we really want to understand for MGO propagation. So moving on to some uh, forecast model results, um, we can think of two ways that the SST forecast skill might affect MGO propagation. The first is the uh, sea surface temperature initialization. If you have a good initialization, you might think that your sea surface temperatures have a reasonable interaction with convection and its development and subsequent wind anomalies. Um, but you can also think about this SST drift, and this is the mean state SST drift that will affect the mean state moisture, which is the other component that affects MJO propagation. So uh, what I'm showing here is MJO forecast skill as measured by the bivariate correlation coefficient for, um, it looks like nine different models in the S2S database, but it's really five. Uh, the top row, these are three different versions of the Bureau of Meteorology model. These are three separate models, and these are three different versions of the ECMWF model in the bottom row. And so what I'm showing here are, um, we, we compare the SST anomaly patterns that the model is initialized with to those from observations, and we compute the spatial pattern correlation skill um, and find the top 25 and bottom 25 most skillful initialized states, okay? So this says when you have um, a model that's initialized with sea surface temperature anomalies that agree very well with observations, this is the top 25, less good agreement, the bottom 25. And what you can see um, is that in some models, there's really virtually no difference in MJO 
prediction skill according to whether you have a good um, ocean initial state or a poor ocean initial state. For some models, you do see a larger difference, but I will point out these differences are not statistically significant. If I were to draw error bars on these curves, they're, they're just huge, okay? So the uh, SST initialized state, um, at least the anomaly does not seem to be the leading order cause of MJO prediction skill. So now I want to go back and turn our, my attention to the SST drift because the hypothesis is that as goes the SST drift, so goes the mean state moisture drift. And what I'm showing here is for the same uh, nine model versions is the 30 day SST drift um, across the Indo-Pacific warm pool. And so you can see that some models drift colder, some are fairly neutral. This version of the model is actually flux corrected. So we expect it to have very little drift. Um, and then some models drift actually positive SST in certain locations. Now, just to show you, to give you a better idea of what the strip looks like, if we look at the um, SSTs averaged in this box here for this model, what we're showing in the lower left panel, this is the lead dependent SST climatology. So the black line is the true climatology. And then um, as we go from blue to red lines, this goes from a lead day one to lead day 30. So you can see during the first half of the year, the model drifts warm. During the latter part of the year, it tends to drift cold. Um, so you can, this is the same picture. I've just subtracted the black line from each of the colored lines here. And you can see that at times the lead dependent climatology is nearly one degree C. So over just 30 days, your uh, climatological average SST um, departs a full degree Celsius from climatology. So that's pretty significant. Now, if we want to understand um, what is causing this source of drift, we're just going to consider this example from the ECMWF. And to do this, we're going to look at the SST tendency, which here is the model drift. And you can consider that there are two basic processes that contribute to this. One would be drift in the net surface heating, the, which would directly contribute to SST tendency. And the other is drift in ocean processes. And the way we're going to analyze this, I'm just going to do this because my keynote to PowerPoint trans, uh, translation was a little bit odd. There's, there's a few steps. So I'm going to try to break it down. The first thing we're going to do is compute the SST lead dependent climatology. So that's what's shown here. This is from zero to 30 days. You can see that for this region in the Western Pacific, the SST increases by about a third degree Kelvin. From this, you can compute the SST tendency, which is shown here in the blue curve in the second panel. Then we're also looking at the uh, lead dependent drift in the surface, uh, the net surface energy flux. So heat flux into the upper ocean. You can see that these two curves tend to follow a similar trajectory. And in fact, if you regress the tendency, onto the net surface, you can then predict the amount of SST tendency that is directly correlated to the net surface heating. And what, that's what you get in this curve shown in orange. So um, the surface flux predicted SST tendency really accounts for most of the variability in the blue curve. Everything else, the residual, we attribute to ocean processes, okay? Um, most forecast models really only provide you with SST, so all of the ocean processes have to be inferred unless you're lucky enough to have ocean output from your uh, forecast model. And then finally, we can say, okay, it's the net surface flux that's really contributing to most of the drift. If you like, and I won't talk about this much further, you can then drill down and assess um, which of the four terms most contribute to the flux drift. And for this model, the net surface short wave and latent heat fluxes roughly equally contribute. Um, in general, the long wave and sensible heat flux terms are small. They usually offset each other too. Okay, so I want to go back here. 
this is for one region of the ocean. And for this point, we can see that by and large, it is the surface flux drift that is responsible for the SST drift in this region. But you can say, well, what's going on here? So if we repeat this exercise for every single grid point in this domain, we can um, quantify how much of the SST drift is driven by surface fluxes, how much is driven by ocean processes. So this is what I'm showing here for Got all it. of these models. You yes. have two, two, two minutes to wrap up. Okay, perfect. Um, so the way this is plotted, uh, I'm not going to show the details. Uh, it's a nice exercise by a paper by Daria Halkidis in 2015. It's a balance factor. Essentially, the more blue shading you see, the stronger the drift is controlled by the ocean. The where it's more orange or red, the more strongly the drift is controlled by surface fluxes. And the real take home message here is that uh, somewhat surprisingly to me, there's a lot of regions where SST drift is not really well correlated with net surface energy flux drift. Um, this, it, there's a lot of variability from one model to the next, one region to, th to the next, but it's very hard to make any broad statement about why do models uh, experience SST drift. Um, and so I'm going to skip my next couple slides, but I just want to come back to this point about MJO propagation. We're looking at drift, and usually when we evaluate MJO forecast skill, we look at lead depend, we subtract out the lead dependent climatology, right? But the point in looking at the drift here is that as the model is integrated, the model equations itself are um, operating on the moisture that is there, the SST that's there, the moisture that's there. And especially for the MJO, these wind anomalies are acting on the mean state moisture. Um, so I think it's kind of impossible to completely uh, remove the effects of SST drift on this MJO propagation problem. So I think I will just close with a plug for the S2S database, which does include some ocean output variables um, that could help better understand this blue term for various models, for example. Um, and I will close right there and take some questions. Thank you very much. Um, and sorry, I did not mean to rush you. It, it, no, that's quite all right. I, I really very much uh, uh, liked your talk and, and the points you're making. Um, Arun has a question. Arun, go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh, thanks, Charles. Nice talk. Great talk. Uh, can you summarize again? How did you quantify the quality of SST initialization? Yes. Okay. So you are talking about this plot? No, it was at, at the very beginning when you said some, some SST initializations were bad and some were better. Oh, next, yes. Next one. Okay. Right. I won't try to find the slide. Yeah. So we. Um, it was just a couple of slides down. Okay. We looked at the, we compared. Right. This one. Compared the SST anomalies. Um, in the model initial state to the NSEP, the, no, I'm sorry, the OISST SST anomalies. So there are other ways you could do this. You could use like a more, um, you know, other data sets, but it was, it was sort of just a, uh, a simple assessment. We compared the SST anomalies present in the model initial state to those that you would see in the observational record. Okay. And it's just like a pattern correlation across the, you know, the same domain that I showed in most of these plots. All right. I mean, I would assume that correlations, differences are pretty small in good and bad. They generally are. And although, you know, larger differences from some models than others. And I confess, I, I don't have a slide that shows this, um, nor do I recall the exact details, but I could look okay, that thanks. up and maybe, maybe let you know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hemi, you were next. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so Charlotte, you, you showed at the beginning that the SST is closely related with the moisture distribution and uh, this is the key. So how does your SST bias link with this, uh, this prop, uh, process? 
That's right. So I actually did not even touch on that. Um, you know, some of your work has shown you can have initial state biases in column water vapor. Mm -hmm. And you, and yeah, so you could also have initial biases in SST. Um, so is the SST and the moisture bias uh, similar? Did you find a similar pattern? I, ha I have looked at that. Um, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, in, yeah, I've actually looked at these, the, the correlation, the temporal correlation point mm -hmm. by point in the SST drift and the column water vapor drift is very high in certain locations. Okay. Um, in some reasons it's not. And so one of the slides I skipped over was like this colony rule. If you try to narrow this down to regions where the ocean appears to be driving the atmospheric vari variability versus mm -hmm. vice versa. Um, yeah, the drift is actually really high. And I think that's because convection um, operates very quickly. When there's a drift in SST, the convection responds very quickly. And whatever convection is going to do to moisten the troposphere, that process is very fast. And I think that's probably why the two are so strongly correlated. Um, in regions where the SST drift could influence the atmosphere drift. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Magdalena. Yeah, uh, hello, Charlotte. Thank you very much for the talk. I think it's very important work. I mean, very relevant for model development, this piece of work. Uh, I had a question regarding with the surface plexes. There is quite a lot of uncertainty on surface plexes. So do you do know or do you have an idea whether the uncertainty in fluxes could affect your estimation of what are the relevant processes? That's, that's a great question and certainly they can. Um, I've been doing a little bit of work with a, a surface flux intercomparison project that by Caroline Reynolds is helping organize. And, and, and so really, we, I mean, even just which bulk surface flux algorithm is used in a model can really have a pretty substantial impact on how much energy is transferred from ocean to atmosphere at various phases of the MJO. Um, and we're, we're kind of finding um, through some other work using the DOE E3SM model is that these uh, algorithm specific differences in the surface fluxes are not uniformly distributed throughout the MJO phase. So it's really interesting. Um, so it's not just that the fluxes are either uniformly too high or too low. It appears if you uh, change uh, one bulk flux algorithm to another, you will see, for example, a greater surface flux from the ocean to atmosphere when you have strong convection and a, re, a re, more reduced surface flux when the convection is suppressed. So it could widen the distribution of fluxes. But yeah, that's something we're sort of just getting into now. And it's, it's, it's really interesting to think about how, two things, I mean, how the fluxes can affect the convection, but also how those fluxes might affect the patterns of SST drift and SST anomalies in these simulations. Uh, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I think we should go to the next talk. Jacqueline has uh, typed her question in the chat, so maybe you could respond to it. Great. Um, so thank you so much, Charlotte, for finding the time between other commitments to give us this really <laughs> interesting talk about such an important topic. So thank you so much. You're welcome. I